Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week we're gonna do another update on Starlink. I was watching a launch and deployment uh, Sunday morning and I thought it might be fun to see where things are at. And I found there's been a lot of progress actually on the entire uh, Starlink system. The company is now talking more about the kind of bandwidth you might experience. We're getting some numbers on latency. So we've got a lot of news to cover here on Starlink's development. Let's get to it. Now, Starlink is a broadband internet service from SpaceX, which is Elon Musk's rocket company, the same people that launch astronauts into space. In fact, they're using the same rockets they use to launch astronauts into space to lift these Starlink satellites into orbit. And this is a low Earth orbit constellation, which means that they need to launch thousands of these satellites in order to provide service throughout the globe. And they're targeting rural portions of the United States and other portions of the world where it's hard to get fiber optic internet delivered in a way that is commercially viable. To date, Starlink has launched 835 satellites. 51 of those have been deorbited already. Most of them were part of their first batch of test satellites that they were using to uh, get the system figured out. And as of today, they have 784 operational satellites and they're launching at about a two week cadence. About every two weeks, they send another 60 into orbit and things are moving along pretty quickly as they continue to get their constellation up there. And for many people throughout the United States, this constellation can't get into orbit soon enough. A bunch of you wrote in with the news that AT&T decided to kill off their DSL service without much warning. And at this point now, if you are in a rural community where DSL from AT&T is your only option, you cannot get new service. They're not gonna turn off anybody just yet, but if you were to move from one house to the other or something, you're out of luck. And unless you've got a decent LTE cell tower nearby, you're not going to have any usable broadband service. And this is a real nightmare uh, for millions of people here throughout the US who are going to essentially lose a critical piece of infrastructure until something like Starlink is in place. Now at the same time, AT&T was canceling their DSL service for rural America. Their union, the Communication Workers of America, released a report about what they say is the company's digital redlining, basically focusing on only places with high income. And if we take a look at the executive summary of that report, there's some interesting statistics here. The first is that AT&T has made their fiber to the home product available only to a third of the households in its footprint. Across rural counties, only 5% of households have access to that fiber product. And then for 28% of the households in its network footprint, AT&T's internet service, presumably DSL, does not meet the FCC's 25 megabit down, three megabit up benchmark to be even considered a broadband product. And they're prioritizing network upgrades in wealthier areas, leaving lower income communities with outdated technologies. And in many cases, the medium income in the areas with fiber is 34% higher than those with DSL only. Now, yes, this report is funded by the union representing people that would install more fiber optic cable if there was more to install, but I don't think anyone in rural America will dispute the findings here. AT&T hasn't made investments in their infrastructure, and I would argue that the situation on the ground is actually worse than what the report lets on because this report is only looking at existing AT&T infrastructure. It's not looking at all the markets that AT&T left. And one market is right here in my home state of Connecticut. They sold their wireline business to Frontier. Frontier went bankrupt and hasn't really made any sizable investment in fiber optic technologies here. And for many people in rural Connecticut, DSL is their only option. So the uh, issue here is far worse than just AT&T. And in many cases, AT&T got out of markets and sold it to a company that isn't making the investments either. And we're really behind here in the US. So given all of this, there's a lot of hope riding on Elon Musk's rockets that Starlink is going to be the solution that many people have been waiting for. The service, as we mentioned a few weeks ago, is in a very limited beta, mostly in the Northern US. And a lot of the beta users have been in the Seattle area and above. And there have been some real world applications already for Starlink. Uh, one of them has been with Washington State. They've been having some pretty devastating wildfires out there. 
and SpaceX worked with their emergency responders to provide a communications infrastructure for them. Uh, the, the state's uh, telecommunications leader, Richard Hall, told CNBC that it's been a uh, great experience so far. He's seeing about a 150% decrease in latency versus traditional geosynchronous satellites that are much higher in orbit. The low Earth orbit satellites are simply closer, so it doesn't take as long for the radio signals to go from the ground to the satellite out to the internet again. So he's seeing some really good uh, latency. Uh, he was quoted here as saying that he's seeing 30 milliseconds consistently. Now granted, there's not many people on the service right now, but that's a pretty good sign that things are good. And he's also seeing about double the bandwidth that he typically sees with the satellites that he was using before. He also noted that it was pretty easy to get it up and running. He said about five to ten minutes to get up, up with the new Starlink terminals, just stick them in the ground and apparently it uh, finds its way. They provided some pictures of the terminals in action. So they had one set up here as a little base station for emergency responders, and they were also able to provide internet access to residents who were displaced. Uh, they also had another picture here of the little base station just kind of on a little stand on the ground with a wire uh, just running across there, and that was all they needed to get it set up and running. So there's some uh, pretty cool things happening out there with Starlink. And SpaceX also connected up a remote Native American reservation in Washington state for the Ho tribe, and they connected a number of residences and I believe their school uh, to the internet at speeds they never had before. And this was a big game changer for them, not only because they didn't have good broadband before, but also because their students have been isolated due to COVID-19, so they can do their remote learning in a way they couldn't do just a few weeks ago. And all they had to do was put those little dishes up on some roofs around the uh, reservation there. So you can read more on Ars Technica, including a Skype interview with one of the tribal leaders, and you can see what the quality of video is uh, over it. Now, SpaceX did a presentation, I think just last week, to the FCC, and we're starting to get more official word from the company as to what we can expect for speeds. Now, they did post here a screenshot of a uh, speedtest.net result. Pretty good results here, 103 down and about 42 up. Uh, that upload speed, by the way, it was better than my cable connection here in Connecticut up until I got my new fiber service installed. So this is pretty competitive. Now, granted, this is probably one of the better scores they got on that speed test, and there's not that many people on the network yet, but this is what they're communicating out to the FCC. And the Starlink subreddit at reddit.com has been compiling a list of verified speed tests from Starlink beta testers. And here at the top, you can see the one that SpaceX included in their report to the FCC with that 42 megabits per second upstream. Uh, the tests that have been done in September have not gotten close to that level, but you can see this is a very good uh, score here on both the uploads and downloads for a satellite-based technology. The ping times look good here as well, so this is all really encouraging. Now, of course, the real test will be when they've got the service out to more customers across the country in different places. Right now, it's only Seattle, but this, again, is encouraging that the system uh, can deliver this when it has the capacity, and it'll be a matter of having enough satellites in orbit to support the number of customers that uh, might be using the service in a given area. But again, all good things so far here, at least from what we're seeing. Now, also this week, SpaceX issued a pretty terse letter to the FCC in regards to latency on the Starlink network. And that terseness was really directed at their competitors who have uh, geosynchronous satellites in a much higher orbit. You can see one sample of the language here uh, where it says the commission should not be distracted by self-interested, ill-informed speculation from GSOs that have never operated an actual low latency system. And I'm getting press releases actually from some of these geosynchronous satellite providers going after SpaceX for Starlink. And one of the reasons why SpaceX is talking about latency with the FCC is because SpaceX wants to get a piece of the rural broadband competition that they're currently running now to get some dollars out there to encourage more infrastructure investment. And at the moment, SpaceX is kind of shut out from a portion of that competition because the commission wants proof that a satellite network can provide latencies that are competitive with a wireline network. And the FCC has set standards not only for bandwidth up and down in megabits, but also latency in milliseconds. And this letter is an effort by SpaceX to say, hey, look, we can meet the standard. And they're saying that the 95th percentile of their 
uh, latency tests that they've been running over the last week or so have come out at around 42 milliseconds in most cases and sometimes less than that. Uh, so it'll be something to keep an eye on as things go on. But this letter was actually pretty aggressively written. And if you like a good read, it might be worth checking out. So a lot going on here with Starlink. We're starting to see a clearer picture as to what's going on. It's interesting to hear SpaceX talking more about latencies and bandwidth that we didn't hear them talking about in the past. So it looks like they're trying to hit that 100 down, 40 up target for this service. And I think that's gonna be a great improvement for many of you out there struggling with your bandwidth. And I've heard from a lot of you over the last couple of months as I've been doing these little updates and I'm very excited to see this developing. And I'm looking forward to Starlink just because I'd like to have a secondary internet provider for when things go down here. I could stick that thing out in the backyard and get a decent connection upstream and the upload speed would be faster than what I could get over the coax connection I was using up until a few weeks ago. So all good stuff, very encouraging. We'll have to see uh, what develops here as Starlink continues. Uh, one other note is that somebody on Twitter had asked Elon Musk about moving vehicles, and it looks like that's part of their plan as well, although I think they're probably going to stick to a base station to start. So it looks like there's going to be quite a lot of utility here. And for those of you who travel a lot and want that connection with you where you go, it looks like they're contemplating that too. But those details have not been released by the company just yet. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. We had a bunch of super chatters this week during our live streams. They included Brian Parker, Mark Dell, Carol Chermazinski, and Metal Beer Solid. I wanna thank you all for your support during those streams. And we also have some new supporters on the channel. Beaminge contributed via the YouTube membership program and David Atwood contributed via our donor box page. I wanna thank everyone for their contributions this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, if you wanna support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We also have that YouTube membership button right below this video where you can click and join there. And we also recently joined Floatplane if you want to sign up over there if you're using that service. Now on the channel this week, we had our collection of live streams. They were all about the Amazon Prime Day events that were going on. So we managed to get in the Acer laptop that was one of the uh, big deals of the day. So we set it up and started playing around with it. That's the a uh, new Spin 5 with the square display. We'll have a review of that hopefully coming up this week. Uh, we also took a look at the Pixel 4, not the 5, because the 4 was on sale, although we did review the Pixel 5 this week. And then we also were playing around with some advanced topics on the Fire TV. We were plugging in Ethernet devices and just kind of seeing what we could do with that little TV stick. So lots of fun little live streams that we did during Prime Day. Uh, we also had an unboxing video of that Acer Spin 5 on the Extras channel. If you want to get a look for yourself what that square screen looks like, a pretty unique looking laptop if you ask me. And then on the main channel, we had the review of the new Pixel 5. We also looked at the IdeaPad Slim 7 from Lenovo, which has an NVIDIA GPU on board, a nice slim 14-inch laptop. And we took a look at the two new portable SSDs from SanDisk, and what uh, inspired last week's wrap up was the differences between these two drives and the confusing state of USB. And you can check out that review and last week's video to learn more about the many different standards that make up USB these days and how confusing it really is for consumers. Now this week on the channel, we've got some interesting stuff to take a look at, including that Acer Spin 5. I also bought this on Amazon the other day because I think it might be helpful in my kitchen. This is an Android TV unit with a, I think a 20 inch display. So it might be easier to see across the room. And I'm gonna play with this to see what it's all about. And it might be a good replacement for the little tiny screen on my uh, Google Assistant that I have up there at the moment. So I'll uh, be unboxing this and setting it up during a live stream this week. So set your notifications. Uh, we're also going to unbox and set up the Quest 2 and maybe get a review up this week from Oculus. I love the Quest 1 and I'm looking forward to seeing what the higher resolution and frame rates will be like in this new device. So be on the lookout for that. And I'm still trying to find some time to do my overview of the new Apple Watch 6. I've been using it now for about a week and a half, two weeks, and I think I've got a good 
idea as to what I want to talk about with the watch, so stay tuned. That might be another video we have this week, and I'm sure I'll have some other stuff that I'm not even thinking about at the moment. Now, if you want to be notified whenever I go live or upload something, you can click on the bell to get those notifications delivered to you. You can find me in a bunch of other places, including Floatplane, as I mentioned before. And I would love for you to follow me on my Amazon page, which you can find right down there on the last link, lon.tv slash Amazon shop. And I'm trying to build up my follower base there. You can engage with the channel on my very infrequent email list. We've got the Facebook group, which is really buzzing with activity these days. And then, of course, we have the store where I sell previously used items that I reviewed here on the channel that I purchased. And I've got a bunch of stuff that I've been meaning to get up there. I know I keep talking about this. And if you want to be notified when we do put something on the store, I've got an email list just for that. So every time I add stuff, I send out an email. And you can go to lon.tv slash store alert to add your name to that list. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. Thank you all for your continued support and viewership and comments. Keep those coming, please. We've got a fun week ahead, and I hope to see you during one of my live streams that we'll be doing throughout the course of the week. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.tv supporters, including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, Mike Patterson, and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.